Picture this. Dedicated and overwhelmed staff are keeping a man alive in an intensive care unit. They're meticulously monitoring his vital signs and reporting it on their paper charts. They're manually adjusting his treatment. And every 12 hours, they're passing along their paper documents to their next staff member. This manual and exhausting reality is in stark contrast to another that I'll show you now, which is quite literally AI-driven. Self-driving cars are around our cities now. I had the pleasure of sitting in one today and noted that the many hundreds of sensors around the vehicle could quickly make a snap second decision to improve the outcome for me and my safety. These two realities are in stark contrast to one another, and yet they exist in our current world. I'm Dr. Amanda Williamson, and I'm an AI leader and academic. And I come to you today not just as a technologist, but as a daughter. That intensive care unit that I mentioned is one that I've been in a lot this week, as my father is currently fighting for his life. And as I sat next to him in the ICU, I was amazed by the doctors keeping him alive and their incredible efforts. But I couldn't help but notice that they didn't have access to the AI tools that I use every day, that their grueling work wasn't helped by the tools that I help organizations use all through the country. And it dawned on me that there is a huge divide happening in our organizations. This divide is what I call the AI gap. We have advanced technology. Some of it is on our phone. And yet, our most critical sectors in society have technology that is decades old. So today, I want to take you on a journey to understand this AI gap, and most importantly, how we can address it. ChatGPT and other generative AI tools have changed the way that your average individual can interact with AI. We can now create a letter with a simple prompt, generate images and video with a description, and even create a computer program just by giving the AI a description. Yet, none of this is in some of our most critical infrastructure. Let me ask you in this room, how many of you have used AI that you'd called an advanced AI directly in the past month, like ChatGPT? If you could please raise your hand. I'm seeing most hands, if not all, are raised. Now, who can raise their hand to attest to seeing AI used in the public sector? For example, in a government service interaction or in a public health space recently? If you could raise your hand. I cannot see a single hand in the room. This illustrates how wide that divide is between the AI that we have in our phones and the AI where it needs to be. So let's talk about why that matters. If you think back to my dad and those nurse and medical staff doing such a great job, I can't help but wonder what would happen if they had an AI assistant that could summarize the plethora of data points that they track each day. 
if they had a real-time translator to better communicate with their colleagues in any language and maybe even families too? And what would happen if they could make decisions that were supported by AI in real time? How that might be able to help their workload and help them save even more lives? So let's explore why this divide is happening. And I'll tell you a story about an executive I worked with named John, and he encountered three big hurdles. And these hurdles are not just in his organization, they tend to repeat across, across most organizations that we encounter. The first hurdle is understanding. He had heard a lot about AI every time he went onto social media, he saw people talking about it. He saw it in the news. And yet, he didn't know what was hype and what was actually something that he could use to make a difference in a pragmatic way in his organization. The second barrier was implementation. Once he looked into what it would mean to implement these tools in an enterprise setting, the amount of complexity and cost was overwhelming. It's not often understood, but to implement AI in an enterprise system, it often requires identifying data and labeling it for its sensitivity, sometimes making investments in infrastructure and cloud technologies, and very often upskilling staff or hiring new people to help make this a reality. It's also got change management practices and a lot of extra complexities that just seemed like too much to even get started. The third issue that he dealt with was trust in AI. He got really excited once when he saw some people in the organization with an opportunity to fast track insurance claims using AI but they encountered a critical problem. They couldn't determine why AI was accepting some insurance claims while rejecting others. They realized that the amount of bias and privacy concerns that that would open themselves up to was far bigger than the benefits they could gain from it. These three barriers were hugely problematic for him. And these are barriers that we don't encounter with the end user tools that we tend to come across, such as the use of ChatGPT. So how did he overcome them? Well, he took some really simple steps. And the first one was to educate himself. He wasn't a technical person, but he knew that he could just find one little thing which is, what are the AI use cases that are having an impact in my industry? And he started there, little by little. What he was able to find was that there were some low-hanging fruit, some very simple and low-risk use cases to experiment with. And that's what he did next. He experimented. He started small. Instead of trying to get all of the cost and complexity, get everything sorted out with AI, he started very small and gave a team a mandate to experiment, experiment in one part of their business. This was incredibly effective because that team could upskill themselves, they could get competence, and they could increase the readiness of their organization incrementally gaining value and understanding about what the return of AI really was for all their organization. And finally, he put ethics and trust at the center of his AI efforts. He realized that he had to make some hard decisions about some non-negotiables when it came to AI. For him, that meant there was just some areas they were not going to use the most advanced AI, but he, instead he was going to use explainable AI. AI in decision making that could tell you why it made a certain outcome, 
Why? What parameters did it use? These three approaches were fundamental for his success. As we look to the future, it's not yet clear if this AI gap will widen or if it will narrow. This remains to be seen if AI will be a cause of division or if it will be something of inclusion. And I suspect a lot of this will depend on the decisions that we make and our organizations make to go on this AI journey. So I challenge you to be a bridge builder in the AI revolution. If you're a business leader, find just one use case that you can implement in your organization, starting small, but thinking big. If you're an educator, consider how you can introduce AI literacy in your lessons. And if you're a worker, investigate how AI can be used in your services and spark conversations with others in this space. Because I think we stand at a crossroads where it could go either way and the implications for society and the most vulnerable people in it depends on the choices that we make now. But hopefully, with our collective efforts, the next time we have to visit a family member in the ICU, I would hope that those nurses would be supported by AI systems that are as easy as the self-driving car. AI that's not just for convenience, but AI to make lives better and in some cases, save them. <laughs>